Dr. Grandin is a designer of livestock handling facilities and a professor of animal sciences at Colorado State University. Facilities she has designed are located in the United States, Canada, Europe, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, and other countries. In North America, almost half of the cattle are handled in a center track restrainer system that she designed for meat plants. Curve shoot and race systems she has designed for cattle are used worldwide and her writings on the flight zone and other principles of grazing animal behavior have helped, me have helped many people to reduce stress on their animals during handling. She has also developed an objective scoring system for assessing handling of cattle and pigs at meat plants. This scoring system is being used by many large corporations to improve animal welfare. Other areas of research are cattle temperament, environmental enrichment for pigs, reducing dark cutters and bruises, bull fertility, training procedures, horse perception of novel objects, and effective stunning methods for cattle and pigs at meat plants. She obtained her Bachelor of Arts at Franklin Pierce College and her Master's in Animal Sciences at Arizona State University. Dr. Grandin received her PhD in Animal Sciences from the University of Illinois in 1989. Today, she teaches courses on livestock behavior and facility design at Colorado State University and consults with the livestock industry on facility design, livestock handling, and animal welfare. She has appeared on television shows such as 2020, 48 Hours, CNN Larry King Live, Primetime Live, 60 Minutes, The Today Show, and many shows in other countries. She has been featured in People Magazine, The New York Times, Forbes, U.S. News and World Report, Time Magazine, The New York Times Book Review, and Discover Magazine. In 2010, Time Magazine named her one of the most one or one of the 100 most influential people. Interviews with Dr. Grandin have been broadcast on national public radio, and she has a 2010 TED lecture titled. The world needs all kinds of minds. She has also authored over 400 articles in both scientific journals and livestock periodicals on animal handling, welfare, and fat of facility designs. Excuse me, sorry. She is the author of Thinking in Pictures, Livestock Handling and Transport, Genetics and the Behavior of Domestic Animals, Guide to Working with Farm Animals, and Humane Livestock Handling. Her books, Animals in Translation and Animals Make Us Human, were both on the New York Times bestseller list. Animals Make Us Human was also on the Canadian bestseller list. Her latest book, Calling All Minds, was a New York Times bestseller for middle school students. Her life story has also been made into an HBO movie titled Temple Grandin, starring Claire Danes, which won seven Emmy Awards and a Golden Globe. The movie shows her life as a teenager and how she started her career. In 2017, she was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame and in 2018 made a fellow by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She was named as one of the top 10 best college professors in 2020 by CEO Magazine. In 2022, she was awarded with the University Distinguished Professor Degree at Colorado State University. Thank you so much, Dr. Grandin, for agreeing to speak with me today. It's um, it's lovely. It's lovely to be able to do this with you. Thank you. It's, it's really good, really good to be here. Thank you so much. And, you know, as we were just speaking about, I, I know your background is uh, very vast and mostly in animal sciences, but we have also talked about your, your autism your autism diagnosis and if if i may ask was when you were a child was autism even a term or were you one of the first people diagnosed with that well i was born in 1947 oh. and i had all the symptoms of severe autism no speech <laughs> rocking tantrums repetitive behavior and the doctor i went to was a neurologist and the neurologist didn't know what autism was but they referred me to a little speech therapy school where they did a lot of the very good early intervention stuff very similar to what's done today and I learned how to talk I learned how to take turns at games 
That's really important. Learning how to wait and take turns. And then a lot of emphasis on basic skills, like uh, using utensils when you eat, for example. Right. And and when you were young, did you did you realize that you thought differently to other people? How how did you realize that? Was it did did you interact more with animals at that time? Well, I thought everybody thought in pictures. Now, if you watch the HBO movie Temple Grandin, that shows exactly how I think. All my memories are like little pictures, sort of like those little phone, live phone pictures where they move a little bit. That's kind of how my memories are, a series of those small pictures. And I thought everybody thought in pictures until I was <coughs> late 30s. I had no idea that some people thought um, in verbally, in words. You know, in my new book, Visual Thinking, Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns and Abstractions, I discuss um, research that shows that there's picture thinkers like me, and then there's math thinkers, pattern thinkers. They think patterns, not pictures. And then there's word thinkers. And then there's a lot of people that are mixtures. But let's go back to the object visualizer. That's my kind of thinker. There's a whole chapter on visual thinking on, on the science, on the different kinds of thinking, kind of stuff we're good at. Animals, art, photography, and mechanical things. Art and mechanics go together. Mathematicians, math, and music tend to go together because it's patterns rather than pictures. Now, the things that I can't do is higher math, like algebra. It's just too abstract. There's nothing to remember. And I've worked with a lot of skilled people that build equipment for me. They couldn't do algebra either. But one of them's got a corporate, um, got his own corporate jet, and he flies all around, and uh, he's memorized how to build an entire beef plant. It's just in his head. Now, now, can can he replay that? Can he go back and re? Oh yeah, oh yeah, he can replay it. Yes, I can do the same thing. I remember when I first went into a big beef plant, it was a swift plant, Tallis in Arizona. When I first looked at it, I go, this place is so complicated. How does the plant manager understand it? Well, I've since learned that some of the verbal thinkers don't fully understand that. But I didn't know that at the time. And I, and I kind of made my own self-main internship. And I went over there every Tuesday afternoon for months. And after a few months of Tuesday afternoons, I videotaped the entire plant into my head. But that did not happen overnight. That was a lot of Tuesday afternoons and a lot of walking around in there and standing on this big overhead catwalk. Right. It doesn't happen. Right. Sure. Um, do you, I just took a picture of it that quickly. Do all autistic people have that thinking in pictures or does that really go across the, the spectrum? That's not necessarily. No. no. Okay. Oh, uh, what autistic, what autistic people tend to have, they might be an extreme object visualizer, but you can get another autistic person who's an extreme mathematician and maybe a top physicist or a computer person. And then you get some other autistic people that are verbal thinkers and they often love history and facts. And they can often be very good at what I call specialized retail, selling office supplies, selling auto parts, selling sporting goods, selling cars, because they have knowledge of the products. And can remember and can pull back that knowledge, uh, I suppose, as yes. well. Yes, yes, the auto, the auto supply store loved him. He memorized every part in the warehouse and the part number and did not need the computer. Wow, that's, um, that's incredible. And um, Dr. Grandin, did you find that when you were a child um, that your parents really pushed for you to have that social aspect with others that... Oh, yes. Well, one of the things that, that helped me was a 50s upbringing. And in the 50s, children were taught manners in a much more structured way. You were taught to shake hands with people. You were taught to say good morning. You were thought, taught to say thank you. If I forgot to say thank you, I'd be cute. That's the way all kids in the 50s were taught. And I see a lot of grandfathers and grandmothers that are fully verbal that discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. And and they they have good jobs. See, this is the problem you got with autism. You're going from Einstein 
to somebody that cannot speak. Mm -hmm. And then you may have someone who's even more severe with very severe epilepsy on top of the autism. Mm -hmm. So you've got this mm -hmm. huge spectrum. Do you ever have people, do you ever have people that, or do we just not know that are a combination of both that are sort of genius level, but, but nonverbal. So you cannot know. Well, there's, um, there's some nonverbals who can type independently, completely independently typing, you know, like on the word processor or on the text messaging on a phone. They don't send the messages. They just use that program to write with. And some of them have got a normal brain inside, but they describe problems with uh, not being able to control movement, mm -hmm. with not uh, having trouble with initiating responses. And there's some very good books by individuals who are nonverbal who type completely independently. One of my favorites is Tito's, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? And then there's The Reason I Jump by the Japanese boy. And then there's a sequel to that book that's even better because he's older. And he says, well, I'm like a broken robot. I can't control my movements. And and Tito describes a visual scrambling, and like a TV gone bad. And and he they're able to write this out. Oh, like, they're writing it out. They're writing it out in wow. text. Writing it with a you know either word processor or text messaging program. And, and how can, as I mentioned to you, Dr. Grandin, parents of um, nonverbal children such as myself, how can we find out these things or, or develop these types of skills if they're in there? Well, first of all, you got to start just teaching them some words. And what some parents find, I mean, I talked to one parent the other day, I think their kid can read and they don't know it. Um, I've also heard about kids where... Um, they were going on the internet and searching up like serious news and stuff like that, along with their cartoons. And uh, the parents pulled a search history and the kid was looking stuff really up serious news stuff, not just, and reading it. Parents didn't even know it. They pulled a search history. That's how they found out. Wow. And, and, and and what do you do when you when you realize you have this type of skill skilled child? Well, to... then you need to, need to be um, encouraging them that can, can't talk, but they can type on the iPad. Now, the, one of the problems these individuals have is attention shifting problem. Like I've got a desktop here, my keyboard's way down here. If I use a word program, that here's way up there. Mm -hmm. Now they can't make this shift. That's why you have to use something like an iPad where the print appears next to the virtual keyboard. You can also get a plastic grating to put over the, the um, virtual keyboard and help guide the fingers. Okay. But they've got to, when they punch a key, they've got to see that letter appear the same moment they punch a key. Then I talked to one parent the other day and their kid was doing it on the phone. And usually... Those are too little. I usually recommend iPad. It's fine. If he can use a phone, fine. But for a lot of them, that would be too little. Right. The iPad's wonderful. Um, the, I, I have or never... some other tablet. You know. Right. Right. Of course. I Now, I've never heard of this happening in my personal experience. Um, but have you ever heard of language starting way... Like, I know you were, uh, I believe you said three or four years old. Can language start way past... How's that? There are a few individuals where language can start later, but there's a lot more of them that can just learn to type. Okay. okay. And the thing is to start off just learning words for, you know, for things that might be interested in foods, things like that. Okay. And, and is, um, it certainly seems to be, but, but maybe I'm wrong. It, is is autism on the rise or is it um, just nonverbal? That seems to be on. The I rise. think I think what's happened is it's increased detection. Okay. I think there's a lot of the nonverbals in the past they labeled them mentally retarded. That's okay. what they did with the nonverbals in the past, and I think the mild autism where you're just slightly geeky and nerdy, I think that's just increased detection, and then all the time that kids are step bending on 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 screens and not being taught social skills the way my generation was taught have contributed to more kids getting getting um, diagnosed. I think it's just increased detection because I can think about 
of people I worked with, people that would be older than me now that I know were autistic. And they were brilliant. I remember a guy working in an electrical shop. He was the plant's resident genius. I got along with him just great. He was probably autistic. Isn't that incredible? And were these the were these the people that just, you know, back in the day we would have just called weird or they were bullied? Well, that we would have just called them weird. Yeah. yeah. Just kind of weird. And and, and I, you know, they learned a skilled trade in school, like electrician or maybe welding. Okay. And they were very, very good at what they did. I think one of the worst things some of the schools have done is taking all the skilled trade stuff out. Some skills schools are putting it back in, but then they're saying, oh, because of liability, we can't let special ed kids take shop. I'll tell you right now, I worked with individuals that if they were children the day they'd be special ed kids, they owned the shops and they had 20 patents each and they sold their stuff around the world. Amazing. They would definitely would have been autistic, but they're people that would be 60s and 70s now, you know, my age. Right. And do you think a lot of the higher functioning um, kids now are are living beneath because a lot of those things have been taken away, are living beneath their potential and sort of stuck? Yes, definitely. OK, absolutely. Definitely. I'm seeing too many kids today growing up. They've never used a tool because I, what's happened with some of the adult video game addicts is about five or six of them got weaned off with auto mechanics. And they found out motors were a lot more interesting. And they got weaned off and they got into good jobs that they really liked. And I just read a big article just today in the Wall Street Journal. They can't get staff to fix cars. So the second business section of today's Wall Street Journal. Now, these these kind of jobs are not going away. You know, we get worried about artificial intelligence, yes. you know, mm -hmm. writing papers for people, or whatever, doing computer programming. It's not going to do heating and air conditioning. It's not going to do plumbing. It's not going to fix the water pumps that get the water to a city. Those jobs are safe. They will not go away. Chat GPT or any other system isn't going to take those jobs over. Sure. And instead of looking our, our noses down on them, a lot of these guys get paid very, very well in these trades. Well, and they get, and they get paid really well. And there's a lot of equipment we're not making today in the U.S. We don't make the state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine. Even though it's based on mathematical physics done in the U.S., it's from Holland. Now, we got one guy who knows how to build a beef plant here, but then you've got uh, pork plant and poultry plant equipment all coming from Holland now. Okay, are they... for that. okay that's interesting. Okay, I, I... There's, a reason for that. there's a reason. It goes back to the educational system. In Europe, in ninth grade, you pick university or tech and they don't put their nose up to uh, tech that's the reason that's why a new poultry plant equipment had to be brought over here in 100 shipping containers ridiculous fascinating and is holland more up um, much more advanced in the farming industry than we tend to be here in north america no no it's not it's just that they're more advanced in 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 doing very very high-end skilled trades but so is germany Mm. And some of other countries in Europe too. Italy, um, there's a lot of food processing equipment that comes out of Italy. Really, really nice equipment. Interesting, and and sort of moving moving to that, Doctor Grandin. How um, with with your autism was was livestock handling or cattle handling just something that came naturally to you? Well, okay, let's go back to visual thinking. Yes, please. And being a visual thinker helped uh -huh. me in my work with livestock. Okay. The very, very first thing I did was to look at what cattle were seeing when they went through a handling facility. And they'd stop at a shadow. They'd stop at a chain hanging down or a coat on a fence. And other people didn't notice that. Okay, we just got to yell at them or hit them or put electric prods on them. And people thought it was really crazy in the 70s when I was looking at what cattle were seeing. But as a visual thinker, that was obvious for, to me. And at the time that I was doing this, I didn't know that other people thought in words. And so an animal is sensory based. In fact, the final chapter in, in visual thinking is about animal consciousness. An animal's sensory based. It uh, thinks in pictures, smells, auditory. There's evidence now that dogs may actually have smell pictures. I just read an article this morning in Science about owls 
and they may have auditory three-dimensional pictures. You see, wow. this is a you know a sensory world that um, is very different from the verbal world. They live in a sensory-based world. And I think one of the reasons why some people didn't think dogs or other animals were not conscious is they, a person who's very much a word thinker has a hard time imagining that an animal can think when it doesn't have words. Well, it's obvious to me. I would never question whether or not a dog is conscious. Right. You know, and I find it hard to believe that there's still a few people that argue that. And I right. think most of it gets down to verbal thinking. The mathematicians don't question whether a dog is conscious. But if you're very, very verbal, I, it's hard to imagine the dogs without words. And then in my book, Animals in Translation, I discuss how being a visual thinker helped me to understand animals. Okay, that is fascinating. That actually explains a lot. So so an autistic person who is not a visual thinker may not, because um, I've seen autistic Well, the autistic person that loves history is not going to be an animal person. Usually. Okay, that explains a lot because I've met autistic the animal person, Okay, an autistic animal person right. is going to be object visualized. Okay. Because of what I have found, there's four things that we're good at. Okay. Animals, art, photography, mm -hmm. and... Uh, Mechanical things. Uh -huh. 